In this episode, is it really possible to build a super continuum laser, the ultimate white light laser source, in a small lab and on a budget? Let's find out. So what exactly is a super continuum laser? Well, we're very used to lasers producing very narrow line widths ordinarily, or very pure colors if you like. However, there are classes of lasers out there that are capable of lasing over quite large portions of the spectrum, for example, dye lasers and titanium sapphire lasers. Supercontinuum lasers, on the other hand, are capable of lasing over a huge range of wavelengths that span from the ultraviolet well into the infrared. We'll take a quick look at the encyclopedia entry on RP Photonics website into what supercontinuum generation is. I'm just going to cover the main points real brief, but I'll link this in down below for those of you that are interested. In short, um, supercontinuum generation is a nonlinear process where we take a, a laser with a high peak power and fire it down a photonic crystal fiber and it spectrally broadens the output for us. The nonlinear processes include things like four wave mixing, self phase modulation, stimulated Raman scattering and a, a whole plethora of others. But in the end, what we get is a very broad spectra. Um, this leads to a kind of laser rainbow, it says. And if we scoot down the article, we'll see a glorious image of one of these super continuum lasers. There it is. Um, so ultimately we end up with a white light output, a continuous white light output that spans the visible spectrum and sometimes well into the infrared and well into the ultraviolet. Um, but we get this beautiful output and this is what I want to look at today. So how might we go about generating super continuum practically? Well, all we need is a short length of photonic crystal fiber and then we're away, right? Um, but let's have a look. So I'm on Thor Labs website here and um, Thor Labs do all sorts of little bits of optical kits and they do a super continuum generation kit. Who knew? Um, and if we scoot down, we've got a nice little diagram here. We need a femtosecond laser, a periscope, an isolator and some other bits and pieces and, and we're done, right? Um, the kit itself though um, is £13,000 and in US money that's about $17,500. Uh, the laser that you use to generate the supercontinuum has to be a femtosecond laser, so a titanium sapphire laser. And they offer these on their website. However, there's no prices. Um, it's one of these price on request. And as the saying goes, if you have to ask what the price is, you can't afford it. Um, I have had a look around on the internet and you can buy a titanium sapphire laser from Delmar Photonics, who are well known for producing uh, really quite inexpensive lasers, and this will set you back about $77,000. If you're familiar with the rest of the content across my channel, you'll realize that I am unfortunately on a very, very small budget that no way stretches anywhere near $110,000 for this kind of kit. So I went looking for some academic papers to see, well, where was this effect first discovered and is it something that is achievable in the home lab? So I found this academic paper in Applied Physics from 1975, and I believe this is the first time a supercontinuum using optical fibers was described. The work was done by Lynn and Stolen, and they worked for Bell Telephone Labs, but we'll just read the abstract real quick, and again, very briefly, we'll cover the main points of the paper. So it says, a new nanosecond broadband continuum source is described. The continuum is generated by nonlinear processes in fiber waveguides pumped with a 20 kilowatt 10 nanosecond dye laser. Uh, the continuum has a bandwidth of about 180 nanometers uh, in the visible with a total power of one kilowatt. The new continuum is in many aspects superior to whatever came before. That's, that's basically it in a nutshell. Uh, but what really piqued my interest is this diagram. Um, so we can see here that they've got a nitrogen laser pumping a small dye laser, the output of which is fed into a fiber waveguide, and then we have a supercontinuum. That's it. I mean, literally, it couldn't be any more simple. We've got a couple of prisms to split out the light so that we can see the output on a screen. Um, they're doing some measurements with a monochromator and an oscilloscope. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an oscilloscope capable of me uh, measuring nanoseconds or picoseconds. Um, but yeah, we can get a supercontinuum out. If we scoot onto page two, we can see some plates. Unfortunately, these are all in black and white, um, but we've got what, I what appears to be a spectrum that runs from about uh, 440 odd nanometers all the way to like 610 nanometers. So from the blue to the red, and this is exactly what we're after. Um, if we take a look at the, uh, the other bits and pieces, it says basically we've got a, a dye laser that's pumped by a nitrogen laser in a non-frequency selective cavity. So no tunable optics in here, just plain mirrors, right? Um, fed into a fiber. The interesting thing about this fiber is it's not a photonic crystal fiber, it's just silica core fiber optic cable. That's it. There's nothing special about this. It's 19 and a half meters of seven micron cable. 
It says by proper alignment and overall couple efficiency of five to 10% is obtained, which is a bit poor, but we're trying to couple a multi-mode beam into a single mode fiber. I mean, so you can't really complain at that. Um, yeah, they tried it with a number of dies. Um, they tried Pilot 386, which is a, a, an ultraviolet stroke violet uh, lasing die. So they got, uh, what's this, 392 nanometers to 537. So from the violet to the green. Um, they tried it with Kumarin 120, and this is 434 to 614. So um, from the blue through to the orange. So they were generating super continuums with, uh, with ordinary fiber optic cable. Uh, there's a couple of other bits and pieces. I mean, the paper's well worth reading. I'll link in the DOI down below for people that are really interested in this kind of stuff. I mean, there's a couple of things you've got to bear in mind. We're coupling, although the, although the, uh, the average power is pretty low, um, we're, we're coupling in peak powers of kilowatts into the end of a fiber that was never designed to handle kilowatts. Um, and so you can damage the fiber. Um, but other than that, it looks really, really straightforward. I mean, it's ridiculously simple. Uh, conceptually, it's the simplest way I've come across generating super continuum, as it has to be said. So with this simplicity in mind, I mean, telecoms cable is dirt cheap, so I had to buy a bunch of this stuff to try it out. This is my super continuum laser setup. Before we get started, a little note on safety with these things. Um, obviously, you should be wearing laser safety glasses, and these will do just fine for the dye laser and the nitrogen laser. Although once we generate super continuum, there are no laser safety glasses in the world that are gonna protect your eyes. And so you've got to make sensible use of beam stops and cameras for this kind of work. At the back here, I've got a nitrogen laser to pump the dye laser. This is actually featured in a previous video and it will produce about 15 milliwatts of ultraviolet light at 100 Hertz. The output energy is 149 microjoules and this occurs in a very, very small time frame, about 2.4 nanoseconds. And if you do the maths, it works out at approximately 62 kilowatts per pulse, which is more than adequate to drive a small dye laser. On the left here is my homemade dye laser. And the dye I'm actually using in this experiment today is still beam three, which lasers at 426 nanometers or thereabouts, uh, way down in the violet. Uh, this was a particularly difficult dye to get hold of, but as we'll see shortly, it's well worth it. Uh, it's not the most efficient dye either, uh, we'll maybe get pulse energies out of here at about 5.6 kilowatts, which according to the original paper should be more than enough to pump this fiber. The output from the dye laser is then coupled into a homemade collimator into this rather large length of fiber. The original authors only used 19 and a half meters of silica fiber. I've actually been experimenting with optical fiber in this setup for a number of weeks now, and I wanted to get the maximum uh, breadth of super continuum I could possibly get out of this stuff. So I actually have sat on the optical bench here some 200 meters of telecoms fiber. Uh, this is single mode 9 micron for anybody who's playing along at home. At the far end of the bench here I have the other end of my fiber mounted in a stable mount and the output of that is directed towards a piece of card so that we can see the output. So I have the dye laser set up here pumping one end of the fiber optic cable. The dye that I'm using is still Beam 3, which is a violet emitting dye. And if we look at the spectrometer window real quick, we can see that it's emitting light at 426.8 nanometers with a line width of approximately 10 nanometers. When we're coupling light with high peak powers into the end of fiber like this, we need to make sure that our optics are clean. Specifically, we need to make sure that the end faces of the fibers are clean, otherwise it'll blow the faces off. As described in the academic paper, the beam coupling efficiency of this setup is really quite poor. Um, that you can expect to couple in between five and 10% of the available light from the dye laser into the end of the fiber. And the reason for this is that the beam is actually highly multimode. If we have a look at a 3D plot of the beam profile real quick, we can see all the garbage and stuff in the beam. It's pretty far away from being a Gaussian beam profile. And we can imagine that really only the center portion of the beam is ever gonna be successfully coupled into the end of the fiber. I'm currently running the system at low power and the uncollimated beam is being projected against this white piece of paper. We can clearly see a sort of uh, diffuse blue spot emerging from the end of the fiber. But once I remove the uh, attenuator from the beam, we'll see something really quite amazing happen. Look at that, that is absolutely spectacular. Without a shadow of a doubt, we're generating super continuum here and we've got very clearly a white light output from a violet laser beam input. Absolutely incredible to see. For whatever strange reason, I'm getting this donut mode 
from the end of the fiber. I've no idea why it is. Um, I've, I've been messing with the setup for hours and hours and can't get it to do anything other than a donut mold. It's probably got something to do with the diameter of the fiber and the wavelength of light that we're producing. If we analyze the light output with an optical spectrometer, we can in fact see that we're generating a super continuum that stretches all the way from 430 nanometers in the blue all the way up to 670 nanometers in the red. This is covering almost the entire visible spectrum. Absolutely superb. I have the end of the fiber connected up to a homemade collimator here and the collimated beam is being passed through a flint glass dispersing prism so that we can see the spectrum projected onto a piece of card. Currently the dye laser is idling and so we can see perhaps 20 or 30 nanometers of continuum there but once I remove the attenuator you're going to see something absolutely spectacular. This is absolutely magnificent. We've got a super continuum here stretching all the way from 430 nanometers in the deep blue all the way up to 670 nanometers in the red. Absolutely awesome. One of the things that you guys won't be able to appreciate looking through the lens of a camera here is that there is visible laser speckle across this entire continuum as well. Absolutely superb. The average output power from this super continuum laser is really quite low, probably significantly under a milliwatt. This makes it really difficult to video the beam through fog. So what I've got here is a long exposure photograph. On the right hand side we can see the white beam emerging from the collimator, hitting the diffraction grating and giving us a beautiful view of the spectrum. Thanks for watching this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below and I'll see you guys next time.